May this meeting have eternal consequences in our lives. May it be decision night for us to take another step closer to Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. Our topic tonight is a financial secret that the world doesn't know. The world's financial plan is leading it to serious debt and bankruptcy. A casual look at the economy indicates that the economy is in crisis. Not only is the economy of the United States in crisis, but the economy of most countries in the Western world is in some serious trouble. Now, a casual look at the economy, you may not think we're in trouble at all. But a little deeper look, understanding consumer debt, understanding the enormous natural, national debt of the United States. And if you look at Eastern Europe, worldwide runaway inflation. I remember when I first went to the former Soviet Union, the currency there is the ruble. And there were 27 rubles equaled one dollar. Today, inflation is so rampant, five years later, it's about 5,000 rubles equal a dollar. In Romania, for example, five years ago, it was 80 to 100 lei equal a dollar. Today, it's 4,500, 5,000 lei equal a dollar. And do you know in the Serbian Republic, it's 27,000 dinar to one dollar? You almost have to come with a wheelbarrow when inflation becomes so rampant. Even in countries like West Germany, there was formerly very little unemployment. But today, as East and West Germany have merged, there's about a 10% unemployment rate in West Germany, almost a 20% unemployment rate in East Germany. The economies of the world are in really, really trouble. You look, for example, at the inflation factor in the United States. From 1960 to 1990, the inflation factor in America is what we call four. That means that goods on the average cost are four times more costly today than they were in 1960. Well, did your salary go up four times or 400% in the last 30 years? What that means is you have less money to buy things today. The economy has become a major political issue. If you look at the political campaign of the United States right now, or the political campaign of most countries, one of the major issues, of course, is the economy. Now, if you think the American economy is pretty good, look at some figures on the United States national debt. In 1900, the national debt of the United States was 1.2 billion. That meant that if every person paid $16, you could pay off the national debt. In 1925, it had ballooned to 20 billion. In 1950, it had ballooned to 256 billion. 1975, 533 billion. In other words, in 1975, if every person in the United States paid $2,500, we could have paid off our national debt. But look at what has happened from 1975 to 1994. Our national debt today in 1994 is over 4.6 trillion. Now I realize it's 1996, but this is the latest figures we we're able to get. 1994, the debt was 4.6 trillion. That means that because the government has no other way but getting money than raising taxes or getting it from you, that if we had to pay our national debt tonight, that means that every person in the United States would have to pay $17,800. It means if you have a family of five, you didn't know it, but you're between seventy-five dollars and $80,000 in debt. Somebody said, well, Pastor Mark, I came here for encouragement and I'm going to leave tonight <laughs> thinking that I was financially solvent and you are sending me home seventy-five dollars to $80,000 as a family in debt. The interest payments on our national debt are about 20% of everything that we pay out as a nation. In fact, many writers and thinkers, sociologists and financiers are really concerned because if you have an enormous debt, someday you're going to have to pay up. Howard Roof has written a book called How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years. And he says this, the purpose of this book is to persuade you that the United States is about to enter its greatest test period 
since the Civil War. He goes on, an inflationary spiral leading to the Depression that will be remembered with a shudder for generations. Howard Roof's book, How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years, he says, no one exactly knows where the breaking point is, but it's coming and soon. America is truly on the brink. And so is the rest of the world. Because when we sneeze, the rest of the world gets pneumonia. If the United States of America ever defaulted on its debt, or if any of the Western countries did, you take Germany facing some challenges tonight, you take some of the countries of Europe that were quite stable, or take Japan that did not know recession for decades. If any of the Western countries had serious financial difficulties because of the trade agreements, because of the interrelationship of global finance, it could throw the world into a serious economic depression. Many books are being written on crisis investing. That is, what to do with your income and how to invest it, indeed, if we t have tough and very difficult times ahead. A book after the crash is a book on how to survive, talking about investing in varying methods to survive. The stock market recently has fluctuated dramatically from record highs to record lows. And it's hard to predict what's happening from one week to the next or one month to the next. It's very difficult to evaluate. In fact, Norman Cousins said this, commenting on our economy, that famed American journalist and writer. He said, we're so busy buying, 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 that we fail to realize that there are some moral screws loose in our society. He said, we keep spending, going into further national debt and further personal debt. And he said, maybe the problem is that there are moral screws loose in our society, that some bricks are cracking, that the foundation is crumbling, and that we might be investing our money in the wrong places. Maybe that's the problem, that we are investing our money in wrong places. Life is extremely uncertain, ladies and gentlemen. For example, you think you're secure and have an absolute magnificent home in the suburbs. You've spent your life to have this home right by the edge of the forest. But a forest fire comes down and rapidly destroys that home, as has happened recently in some of the California suburban wealthy areas outside of Los Angeles, areas like Malibu and Calabasas. Multi-million dollar homes, some of them built by the stars, taken away in an instant as Santa Ana winds have whipped the flames into fury down through those canyons. You feel secure until you come home one night and that expensive video equipment in that entertainment center has indeed been ripped off. It has been robbed and you come home one night and your house has been ransacked. Could it be that we're investing our money in all the wrong places? Could it be that the things we're investing in can be lost instantly? Here's a man that works 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And as he does, he's in a mid-level management position. But he gets a phone call. He's just been made redundant for somebody else who's a rising star in the corporation. He's given his life for something and it's gone. Personal debt is at an all-time high. We've invested in things and our credit cards are maxed out. And yet the interest rates are killing us with our consumer debt. Do you realize that consumer debt, now this is not government debt, this is not how much the government owes, but consumer debt in the United States totals $810 billion. We are a society that is awash in red ink. We are a society that is deeply and seriously in debt. 
And that debt is stressing us out. One of my great concerns for Eastern Europe, and I want to speak directly to the situation in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is experiencing unusual inflation. Freedom has brought with it in Eastern Europe the desire for Western values, Western goods, and Western materialism. And one of the great dangers that Eastern Europe faces tonight is that a spiritual quest when communism was overshadowed by democracy. That spiritual quest will be replaced with seeking material goods. So I appeal to Eastern Europe tonight. Do not go the way of the West that's morally and spiritually bankrupt. There is something about consumer goods that doesn't meet the need of the soul. There is something about material values that doesn't satisfy the heart and the soul. Look indeed at the stress that the seeking of those values has brought. Revelation, the last book in the Bible, written to the last generation of men and women to live on planet Earth, addresses the economy in our day. What does the Bible say about the economy? Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you. And you shall find them no more at all. Revelation chapter 18 predicts the greatest economic collapse in the history. Not a depression in one nation, but a worldwide economic collapse. And if you are grasping at straws, feeling you can be secure because you've got money in the bank. Listen to Revelation chapter 18, verse 14, 15, and 17. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, for in one hour, quickly, suddenly, certainly, such riches come to nothing. Riches come to nothing. Rapid inflation. The economic bottom falls out. If your security is money, you're grasping the wrong thing. If your security is materialism, you're grasping the wrong thing. There is no security outside of Jesus Christ. There is no security outside of the principles of the Bible. We can find refuge in the word of the living God. God gives us clear instructions about the last days. He says that there'll be a last day financial crisis. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth eaten Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you that will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days, James 5, verse 1 to 3. Did you notice the clarity of the passage? A quick, rapid devaluation of currency. Those that heap treasure for the last days and those who are bitterly disappointed. Notice this last day financial crisis. The Bible goes on. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you've kept back by fraud, cry out. Now notice there's a conflict between capital and labor, between the haves and the have-nots. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. James 5, verse 4 and 5. The Bible doesn't mince any words. It says that in the last days, there will be those that put their lives into making money. In the last days, there'll be those that put their lives into materialism, into wealth, in building their personal kingdom. But in an instant, it will slip like grains of sand through their fingers. And they haven't found refuge in Christ. And so when the economic bottom falls out, they will be insanely possessed with fear and worry because that which was their security, their bank account, their credit cards, they no longer have. The Bible says that there's a better way. Indeed, strikes, conflicts between capital and labor in the last days 
of Earth's history. But what is God's solution to our financial problems? What particular financial principles does the Bible give us? What indeed can we discover from God's word to keep us secure so that we can find truly a place of refuge in Jesus in the last days of Earth's history? There are some bedrock principles, some fundamental principles in God's word. As we go back, back in our minds thousands of years, we go back to the day that God created the world. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And as God spoke, this earth came fresh from the hands of the Creator. And as Eden was created by the hands of the living God, the sun shone brightly that fair morning in a blue sky, and magnificent flowers in their colors dotted the landscape. And the Bible says in Genesis 2, verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he formed. It was God that created the earth. This world did not evolve. It was God that carpeted it with living green. It was God that planted the gardens. It was God that caused every fruit tree to give off its fruit and every flower to blossom. What a good God he is. The Bible says in James 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. What a good God he is. He gave us fresh air to breathe. He gave us babbling brooks with their pure crystalline water to drink. He provided for us the tulips with their yellow and red. And he's provided for us an array of color. He's provided for us an assortment of food. The Bible says, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on 10,000 hills are mine. Psalm 50, verse 10 and 12, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, God says, for the world is mine in all its fullness. All of this world belongs to him. He created it. He fashioned it. Contrary to what some say, it did not evolve. Contrary to what some say, it was created by the very word of God. The Bible says, Psalm, in the book of Psalms, 33, chapter 33, verse 6 and 9, he spoke and it was done. He spoke in the powerful word of God, going out of his mouth, that audible word created apple trees. God said, let there be apple trees. And the audible word of God had so much power that apple trees appeared when he said it. What God says is so, even if it were never so before. Because when he says it, it becomes so, because what he declares occurs. When God says it, it happens, because his word carries with it power. He's a creator. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth belongs to him. The earth is his. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them to live on a planet filled with joy, filled with happiness, filled with gladness. But a deceiver came to that garden. When the deceiver came, God had told Adam and Eve, you can partake of every tree of the garden except this tree. The deceiver said, that tree is not God's, it's yours, Eve. Take it, seize it, grasp it. And the first sin had to do with Eve listening to the devil and listening to the devil's lie that self-centeredness brings pleasure, that self-centered egotism brings joy. Satan's great deception was, Eve, eat it. You'll enter into a higher sphere of existence. Eve, eat it. You'll enter in to a greater joy in your life. Eve, eat it. You've never experienced such ecstasy. You've never experienced such euphoria. So the whole plan of the devil was to lead Eve into self-centeredness. But the Bible describes an antidote to that. Acts 17, verse 24 and 25. God who made the world. Who made the world? God did. And everything in it gives to all life breath in all things. Not only did God create us, but God sustains us. Not only did God fashion us, but God keeps every heart beating. 
my heart doesn't beat by some natural rhythm. God keeps it beating. I, every breath I take, I'm not like a clock that God wound up. God causes my heart to beat. God causes my breath. Now here's financial principle number one in God's economics. I'm going to give you seven principles of God's economics. Here they are. Number one, since God created me and sustains my life, everything I have is really his. You see, look, did you will to come into existence? What if you were a nothing? What if you were a mosquito? What if you happen to be hanging on an apple tree and somebody bit into you? Now, don't misunderstand me. Somebody's going to misinterpret and say, hey, that's reincarnation. I'm not talking about that at all. You know that. But what if you didn't exist, okay? What if you never existed? You did not create yourself. Why are you here? What if you were nothing, a zero, a cipher in the universe? It is the will of God that brought you into existence. You were conceived in the mind of God before you were conceived in the womb of your mother. And the Bible says that since God created me, here's a principle, a biblical principle, and sustains my life, everything I have is really his. Everything I own is really God. God created me, God created the world, and God gives me any ability to make wealth that I have. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. God created me, God sustains my life, God opens up doors of opportunity for jobs for me. Anything that I have financially comes from the hand of a loving creator who wants to provide for me, who supply my every need. It's God that gives me the power and the opportunity to get wealth. Throughout the Old Testament, the Old Testament heroes of God acknowledge this in an interesting way. The prophet Haggai in chapter 2 verse 8 says, read it with me please, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, God created it, God sustains our life, and God gives us the ability to get wealth. Abraham understood that he was created by God, that his life was sustained by God, and that anything he had and any victories his armies made came as a result of a gift of God. When Abraham attacked the enemy armies, and when they were overthrown, Abraham brought back a portion of those spoils, and he divided them out. In fact, the Bible says that Abraham came to Melchizedek, the high priest. Let's read it in Genesis 14, verse 19 and 20. Blessed be Abraham of God, most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Now notice Abraham acknowledges God's the creator, the possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. The tithing principle was established early in biblical periods. It was established back there in the days of Abraham. Abraham set aside a tithe. That word tithe means a tenth. As an acknowledgement that God created me. As an acknowledgement that God sustains my life. As an acknowledgement that everything I have is his. He set it aside. We go to and Abraham brought that to Melchizedek, the priest, to be used for the work of God. In giving tithes, Abraham acknowledged God's goodness. He acknowledged God's blessings on his life. Jacob, you remember fleeing after having deceived his father, came to the place in his life where he too said, God, I acknowledge your goodness. Genesis 28, verse 22, the Bible speaking about Jacob says, And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. The Old Testament patriarchs sensed that as creator and sustainer of their life, they could acknowledge God's goodness, acknowledge God's grace, acknowledge God's power, acknowledge God's mercy and favor upon them by returning to God a tithe. Now you might say, what is a tithe? Leviticus 27, verse 30. Let's read it together. 
and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's, is holy to the Lord. So the tithe is not mine, it's the Lord's. No, actually, everything I have is God's, but when I return to him the tithe that he set aside as holy, notice the Bible says it is holy to the Lord. As I return the tithe, a tenth of my increase that's holy to the Lord, I acknowledge his goodness, his power, his creative authority. God's economics principle too. Tithing acknowledges our deep belief that God is both the creator and sustainer of life. When I am faithful in my tithe, it acknowledges who God is in my life. Malachi asked this question, Malachi 3.8, will a man rob God? Now you would think that a person would have to be pretty low if we took an offering up here tonight, and we're not going to do that, we do that on Saturday nights, but if we did, you'd think a person pretty low that when the offering plate was going by to reach in and take out $50 or $100 or $200. In fact, I remember once we were in a major city having a meeting. And in that particular city, a couple criminals came into the meeting. And they wanted to follow one of our large ushers out to the door to jump him. Well, I was thankful that usher was pretty big, but his angels were bigger. And he turned, why, and they just ran down the street quite rapidly. You have to be careful with my ushers because they all have guarding angels, you see. You'd think a person must sing pretty low to rob the offering. But the Bible says, will a man rob God? And so the Israelites asked, Malachi 3 verse 8, how have we robbed thee? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. Now notice the Lord makes a distinction between tithes and offerings. Tithe, according to the Bible, is holy unto the Lord. It's a tenth that we acknowledge his ownership of everything we have. Offerings are free will, whatever we desire to give to the Lord. Now notice the promise. The Bible says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. In other words, don't keep it at home. Bring it into my house, says God, that there may be food in my house. And try me now, says the Lord of hosts. Now, the God says, try him or test him. He says, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, Malachi 3.10. Somebody said, but Pastor Finley, I cannot possibly afford to give tithe to God. Well, the worse off your economic condition is, the more you can afford not to do it. Because the Bible says that when we return the tithe, the holy portion to God, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so that we can't receive it. God himself makes that promise. He says, try me. He says, come to me. He says, test me. Now notice, Leviticus 27, 30, all the tithe of the land is holy unto the Lord. The tithe is set apart. It's holy money. I can't put my human hands on God's holy money. And the worse off I am, the more I should be eager, the further in debt I am, to follow God's economic plan and watch God work miracles. William Colgate, of the great Colgate Palmolive, starting out in business. And he said, God, I must be faithful to you. Began tithing, God blessed him. John D. Rockefeller, known tither. Henry John Hines, of Hines Ketchup, began paying tithe. The story of James Cash Penny is an amazing story. He started out in business. As he started out in business, his business was going poorly. He had a physical collapse. He was up in a little sanitarium, sanatorium, rebuilding his health, walking down one of those corridors in that little health rehabilitation center, and heard the organ playing. Somebody was playing hymns. J.C. Penney walked in there, bowed down, and said, Lord, I'm giving my life to you. He was convicted that even in debt and poverty, he should begin returning tithe to God. And he did. And J.C. Penney department stores have sprung all over America. Take our Le Tourneau, you know, the Le Tourneau earth moving equipment. He determined to tithe and God richly blessed. Whether it's James Craft cheese 
or Milton S. Hershey Hershey bars, basic decisions early on in business that we must be faithful to God and follow that tithing principle. Malachi 3 verse 11 says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so they do not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. But somebody says, Mark, wait a minute. There are people who are faithful to God and faithful to tithe, and they have real problems financially. Why? This promise may not be fulfilled. Did you read the story about John the farmer out in the Midwest? True story. You know it's true, or else I wouldn't tell it to you, but true story. Locusts. Coming through the Midwest, across the prairie lands of Nebraska and Kansas, the locusts came across. They ate every blade of wheat and grass crops in the first farm. Came across the second farm, ate every blade of grass and wheat in the second farm. In the third farm, they were leveling the whole area. Terrible locust crop failure. And these locusts were attacking the crops. They came to Farmer John's farm. He was a faithful tither. He said, Lord, you said to be faithful, you'd protect my farm, stop the locusts. They came right to the fence, and they kept going, and ate the entire farm down. John was amazed. He said, but I was faithful in tithe. And then he got on his knees and had a little talk to the Lord about it. And so some of his atheistic neighbors came over, and they said, John, John, you're faithful, and they ate your farm as well as ours. Explain it. Old Farmer John sat back and he said, that's not difficult, folk. Here's the explanation. A long time ago, I dedicated this farm to God. It's his farm. Those pastures are God's pastures. And to tell you the truth, those locusts are God's locusts. And so if God wants to feed his locusts on his pastures, he can do it. And it's okay with me. <laughs> he then got on his knees and said, all right, God, I don't know what you're doing here. But this is your farm. And those are your locusts. And I believe that although there are temporary setbacks and temporary financial reverses, God, I believe in the long run, in Philippians 4, verse 19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He said, God, I believe in what David said in the Psalms. I was young and now I'm old. But yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken and his seed begging bread. And John started his farm again and miraculously he did better with the second than he did with the first. Amen. You may suffer temporary financial reverses. Now follow me closely. The reason we return our tithes to God is not because we'll be super blessed financially, although that often is the result. But the reason we do it is whether we're blessed financially or not, God is our creator, God is our sustainer, and graciously we respond to his love by returning our tithe and we leave the results with God. And even if there are temporary financial setbacks, God comes through in the long run. We can safely trust him. Proverbs 3 verse 9 and 10, what a promise. Honor the Lord with your possessions. And with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will overflow with new wine. What a promise. I trust God, friend. Honor the Lord with your possessions. With the first fruits of all your increase. And your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will be filled with new wine. God himself says this. God's economics, principle three, giving with the right motive opens our hearts to receive spiritual and material blessings from God. That's an economic principle. If you open your heart to God and you give not to get something in return, but if you're faithful in setting aside 10%, that opens your heart to receive spiritual blessings because self-centeredness is the center of sin in the universe and it opens your heart to receive material blessings from God. I remember I was in the church one day and I had just spoken on tithe. The principle of opening your heart to God and a man came to see me for a private appointment. He was angry. I could tell. I mean, the veins on his neck were sticking out. 
There was smoke coming out of his nose. Red face. I mean, not quite smoke out of his nose, but almost. I mean, he was really angry. And he came into my office and he pulled out of his pocket a whole wad of bills like this. And he said, preacher, you just spoke on tithe. And he said, I've got this bill and this bill and this bill. He just kept throwing them down. $280 worth of bills. And then he said, here's my salary. This was some years ago. It's only $200 a week. Now, preacher, you tell me how I'm going to pay my bills of $280 a week. And I'm going to be faithful to God in my tithe and take tithe out of the $200 paycheck. Preacher, you tell me how to do that. I said, well, John, there's one thing that's obvious. You're going $80 further behind every week. Isn't that right? He said, it is, preacher. I'm going $80 further behind. You tell me how to do it. I said, I only have one question. I'll tell you, but I have one question. Is your method of economics getting you out of debt? He shook his head. You know it's not, preacher. You see, here it is. I said, look, the answer is simple. If you're going into debt, following your way, why don't you try God's way and see if you get out of it? He said, preacher, you answered my question. <laughs> Indeed. God says, be faithful in tithe, and when we seek him first, God grants to us unusual blessings. But tithe is only given with the right motive. In fact, you remember that Jesus talked about tithe as well. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and amos and cumin. Those are little herbs. And have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. Indeed, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Matthew 23, verse 23. Now, here's the New Testament endorsement of tithe. Jesus says, this you ought to have done. And then Jesus says, but not to have left the other undone. In other words, have a heart filled with mercy, with grace, with the love of God, and be faithful in your tithe. Jesus said, mercy and faith and commitment are the essence of Christian life. But he said, when you have that mercy and grace, that will lead you to acknowledge God as the creator by being faithful in the tithing principle. Here's God's economics, principle four. Giving enables us to have a deep satisfaction of advancing God's kingdom. You know, when we are faithful and we bring the tithe to God, and when that occurs, the tithe is set aside specifically for the preaching of the gospel. So as we give our tithes to God and we return that which is holy unto him, when we are faithful in setting that aside and make out that tithe check, God blesses it enormously. It goes around the world for the preaching of the gospel. And when we hear, hear these stories coming from varying countries of the world, we are part of that. It is a worldwide family that together is participating with God and God gives us a chance to be a part every time when my wife and I get our check each month and we set aside that first 10% to God we have the joy of knowing that we're helping the gospel go to throughout Africa we're helping it to go throughout South and inter America we're helping it to go throughout Europe we're helping it to go to the former communist lands that we together are participating with Christ in this final movement he here is God's economics. God's economics is invest your heart in something else. God's economics is who has your heart. Principle five in God's economics, there is no greater motivation to give than the cross. How can I hold back from God? God created me. God redeemed me. God sustains my life, and God gave Jesus Christ on the cross. If God gave Jesus with nails through his hands, with a crown of thorns upon his head, if God gave heaven's best gift, can I hold back anything? Can I keep anything from him? God's principles of economics are clear. The cross says, give your best to me. Principle six, sacrificing for God's cause teaches us deeper lessons of trust. You see, when I faithfully return my tithe to God, when I don't have enough 
and I say, God, it doesn't appear that I can make it this month. When I seek first, Matthew 6, verse 33, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I don't have enough. We're short economically. We don't know how we can pay the bills. But we say, God, I'm going to be faithful in tithe. What does that do? Faith is not faith unless it's faith. And faith is never faith if it's sight. And sight and faith are two different things. When I am faithful to God in the tithe, and I'm on my knees and I say, God, I don't know how this is going to work out. But you've invited me to set aside 10% of my income, my increase for your kingdom and your cause. And God, you told me that 9 is more than 10. In the world system, 10 is more than 9. In God's system, 9 is more than 10. 9 tenths with God will go further than 10 tenths without him. And that takes faith, friend. That takes faith. It takes faith to say, God... You can use my 90% and cause that to expand so it's greater than 100%. And that's where the spiritual life is tested. When you don't have enough, when you're struggling to make ends meet, and you get on your knees and say, God, you do it. I remember a dear friend of mine, Dr. Gerhard Hassel, killed in a tragic auto accident. But Dr. Hassel and I were traveling in Germany once. That was Dr. Hassel's home country, and I so appreciated traveling with him because... I knew no German, and he was so fluent and such a scholar, such a man of God and faith. And he told me a story. He said, Mark, you know, after the Second World War, our family had very, very little. And we were just struggling for food. And my brother Kurt and I and my parents, he said, my parents really believed in prayer. And they were faithful in their tithe all their life in giving it back to God. And he said, after the Second World War, we got on our knees as a little family. My father and mother and my brother and I and our family, and we just knelt there. And he said, I never experienced hunger before. And he said, I was just so hungry. It was after the war years. There was very little German cities bombed out. And he said, we just prayed, oh, Lord, you promised to provide our needs. Lord, we've been faithful to you in tithe. And Lord, we are going to be faithful in tithe even if you don't provide our needs because we believe you've asked us to do that. And maybe you're just testing our faith. And he said after they prayed, he got up off his knees and went to go out the door. And a lady they didn't know walked up the street with a bag of groceries and said, I was impressed to bring these groceries to you. <laughs> Friend of mine, if you walk by sight, follow me closely. You deny God the opportunity to work a miracle for you. You keep God and inhibit God from working a miracle. But if you walk by faith and live in harmony with the principles of the Bible... You give God the opportunity to work a miracle in your life. You see, here's God's economics. The real issue is where are our affections? God does not need our money. God wants our heart. But he tests us to see where our affections are. You remember that Jesus said, What is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16 verse 26. Here's the issue. Where is your soul? Here is the issue. Who has your heart? Here is the issue. What possesses your mind? Here is the issue. Where are your affections? You remember the story of the man that said, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Luke 12, verse 19 and 20. Fool, this night your soul will be, prov will be taken from you. This night your life will be gone. This night you'll die. Put your life into something that's going to last. Put your life into something that's going to count. Put your life into something that's going to endure. There are two ways. One way is the way of getting everything out of you can out of life by trying to make as much money as you can 
live the most comfortable life you can, reach out and grasp everything you can to make yourself happy. That is a way of life. It's a way of life of grasping. It's a way of life of trying to achieve and to get. And some people are driven, they're motivated, that that becomes the sum of their life. But there is another way of life. God, you have created me. God, you have sustained me. God, you have sent Jesus the Christ to die on the cross for me. And God, everything I have with material possessions, they're yours. And I acknowledge that weekly or monthly by returning to you that tithe. And God, I want you to know that my heart's affections are with you as we bow our heads to pray. Would you like to say, Jesus, my heart's affections are with you. Jesus, I'm giving you my life, my soul, my all. Lord, I've been chasing materialism. I haven't found satisfaction. Like chasing a rabbit that I could never catch up to. But Lord, in Revelation's crisis, when the economy falls apart, I want my refuge in Jesus. In Revelation's crisis, when the economy falls apart, I want my security in Jesus. In Revelation's crisis, when my whole life crumbles, I want my security in Jesus. Before we pray.